Good afternoon everyone and also good morning and good evening. I'm Karim Anisha working at Wageningen University and Research. Today I'm going to talk on some key findings on assessment of data sources, data quality and changes in national forest monitoring capacities in the Global Forest Resources Assessment 2005 to 2020. This paper is recently published at Environmental Research Letters. If you are interested, you can have a look to have more insights. So this study was supported by C4's Global Comparative Study on Red Plus and we conducted in partnership with FAO FRA team. We had three main objectives. First, we analyzed the use of remote sensing and NFI data sources for forest monitoring in FRA 2005 to 2020. Secondly, we assessed data quality in FRA 2020 using FAO tier based indicators. Finally, we zoomed into tropical countries to investigate changes in forest monitoring capacities in FRA 2010 to 2020. To assess data sources and country capacities, we used indicators that were developed in previous studies by Romain et al. If you look at the table, you can see that the indicators were ranked between low and very good, where low means countries didn't use remote sensing or NFI data for forest monitoring while very good means countries used multiple and recent remote sensing or NFI data for every FRA assessment. Using these indicator values, we assessed country capacities every five years in FRA 2005 to 2020 and capacity changes over the whole period in 236 countries and territories. For data quality assessment, we used a FAO tier system that includes six indicators. The tiers rank between tier 1 and tier 3 where tier 3 is the highest quality data and tier 1 represents lowest quality data. We performed this assessment for 236 countries and territories in FRA 2020. The findings demonstrated a continuous improvement in the use of data sources. If we look at the remote sensing maps, we can see that the improvements are quite noticeable in Africa. For NFI, the improvements are widespread in the tropics but also in Europe. In total, Around 85% of the forest in 2020 were monitored with good to very good use of remote sensing or NFI. Also, there is almost no decline in capacity. However, multi data sources remain rare, especially in the tropics. Data quality assessment showed that majority of the countries used highest quality remote sensing and or NFI data for reporting forest area status that covered nearly 93% of the global forests in 2020. However, the data quality values are lower for other indicators. If we look at the biomass map, we can see that most of the countries in the tropics used lowest quality tier on data for biomass estimation. This is linked to the use of default biomass conversion factors. In case of carbon pool, only 20% of the countries used highest quality tier 3 data, but that covered nearly 16% of the forest area. We conducted tropical forest monitoring capacity analysis in 99 non-annex on tropical countries. In these countries, we assessed if targeted international support contributed to national capacity improvements. We compiled data on international support for forest monitoring capacity building from the GFOI inventory of activities. We grouped international support for remote sensing and NFI capacity building separately to align it with the capacity indicators, that means forest monitoring data source indicators. Among 99 countries, 49 countries were listed to receive targeted support to improve their remote sensing and war NFI capacities. Capacity improvements in the tropics in relation to international support indicated that more than 50% of the countries with targeted support improved their capacities for both remote sensing and NFIs. A smaller fraction but a significant number of countries also improved their capacities on their own. Or maybe they received support but not reported in GFOI inventory. We can also see that the improvements are more pronounced for remote sensing compared to NFI. It could be due to the fact that NFIs take more time to complete and reporting. However, still there are some countries with and without support, but no visible improvement for FRA reporting. In conclusion, I would like to highlight that there is a continuous improvement in country capacities in FRA 2005 to 2020. Currently, around 85% of the forests are monitored with at least one recent remote sensing or NFI 
However, multi-day data, especially NFI, is rare in tropical countries. This leads to the point that capacity difference in northern and tropical countries is now a more of methodological difference. This means that tropical countries mostly use remote sensing for forest monitoring while northern countries NFI. Another important point is that most of the countries report forest information based on data from 2010 onwards. However, temporal frequency varied between 5 and 10 years in most of the countries with multi-date data. This indicates that biannual or annual updates remain challenging. Here, the use of remote sensing data could be very useful to increase the frequency of country reporting. When it comes to data quality, more than half of the countries globally now use the highest quality tier 3 data for reporting forest area status. In this study, we measure data quality in terms of age and nature of the data. However, there are other aspects such as variations in NFI, field sampling, analytical methods, and data latency can affect data quality which we didn't consider. This could be an important objective in future studies and forest monitoring capacity building initiatives. Finally, capacity improvements in tropical countries in comparison with GFOI inventory of activities showed more improvements with dedicated support for remote sensing and NFI. However, several countries received support but didn't improve capacities and this proportion is comparatively higher for NFI. This warrants a further investigation to reveal how international support or other factors affect tropical forest monitoring capacities. Thank you for listening to the presentation. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Hi everybody, this is Nancy Harris sitting here in hot and muggy Washington, D.C. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the research director of the forest program at the World Resources Institute, and I'm really sorry I can't be there to join you in uh, live today for what should be a pretty interesting discussion on what the research priorities need to be going forward on this topic of land use and greenhouse gases. So I'm just going to spend a couple minutes here outlining some recent work that our team at WRI has done in this space in collaboration with several partners, including Wageningen University of Maryland, the Woodwell Climate Research Center, C4, NASA, others. And this work is really intended to be the tip of the iceberg, a first cut at building what we're calling a data integration framework that's capable of producing spatially explicit accounts of land related greenhouse gas fluxes. And what's nice about this topic, as compared to some of the others being discussed at this workshop, is that a lot of the conceptual framing and definitional issues that we sometimes struggle with, those have kind of already been worked out and agreed upon by the IPCC over the course of its 30 year history. So we have these national inventory guidelines that every country in the world is using to develop estimates of greenhouse gas fluxes associated with that country's land base. And so these are the numbers that countries use as the basis of their NDCs. These are the numbers that will determine whether we are or are not meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. These are the politically relevant numbers to watch with respect to land use and greenhouse gases. And these IPCC guidelines are designed to be flexible, right, and also to be practical for all countries to implement. And so countries therefore have multiple options or approaches for how they represent their land base. But as we see in this pie chart, just a handful of countries are representing their land spatially using what's known as approach three. And so when developing countries started producing their reference levels for reducing emissions from, from deforestation or that first D in red plus, that was really the first time that satellite data came up politically as a cost effective option for monitoring. And so it was being marketed as the best tool for the job of national forest monitoring. And these satellite based MRV efforts were focused almost exclusively in the tropics and almost exclusively on monitoring emissions from deforestation. And so why is that? Um, well, most countries both developed and developing until recently, they haven't had the right data to spatially represent their forests or associated carbon fluxes. But the remote sensing community is changing that very quickly. Over the past several years, we've seen this explosion of maps produced that are relevant to some aspect of forest carbon monitoring. Some of these maps are global, some are national, some are local, but they're all continuing to be produced and updated and refined going forward. So we have these maps of forest change and biomass maps, soil carbon maps, maps showing different causes of disturbance, 
maps of different forest types like primary forests and mangroves, peat, uh, maps showing spatial variability of carbon sequestration rates from natural forest regrowth. Many other maps are, are not shown on this slide. For example, the maps that Frederica Shard and colleagues published recently on tropical degradation and regrowth. And this list will continue to go on and on as the research progresses and improves. And in the introduction and conclusion sections of all these papers, they state how important these products are for carbon, but they all represent just one piece of a much larger puzzle. And so our goal has been to take whatever spatial observations on forests that have already been produced by the research community and integrate them into this policy relevant IPCC framework to produce global spatially explicit maps of annual forest related emissions since the year 2000, annual average forest carbon removals since the year 2000, and average net forest related greenhouse gas flux calculated as the difference between those first two maps I showed of emissions and removals. And I'm not going to go into the details of how we actually created these maps. The point of this pitch is to help kick off a discussion about what's needed to get from where we are now with these maps to where we actually want to be. And because this is such a new way of doing things, there are still plenty of research gaps to be filled and plenty of next steps to be taken. And the thing to keep in mind here is that some improvements to this uh, framework can be used uh, can be made using remote sensing approaches, but other aspects are going to need other types of data. But the overall idea here is that we want to keep it data driven based in observations as much as possible and based in something that countries can implement over large regions. So I'm going to list a couple agenda items here for, for research uh, discussion, several of which relate to the topics being discussed in some of the other breakout sessions, but they're also relevant here. Um, first is capacity building. We want to encourage that approach three wedge of the pie chart I showed at the beginning to become much bigger than it is now. We want more countries moving in a spatially explicit direction towards greenhouse gas accounting for forests because it's going to help a lot in improving the global model we have now with local data and in understanding the where and the when and the why of the numbers that are getting reported. And it's also going to help in understanding and quantifying the impacts of specific policies related to land use that get implemented in different places. Second, uh, we need better attribution of forest disturbance. The assumption for Red Plus has often been that all loss of forest cover equals deforestation, but we know that's a simplification. We know that's not true everywhere. It's certainly not true in landscapes dominated by forest management, but we also know loss of tree cover occurs even in the tropics from things like fires or blowdowns from windstorms and other temporary disturbances. So yes, the goal is to quantify carbon fluxes, but we also want to understand what processes are driving them where, because that allows us to be more targeted in the design of our policy interventions. Third, and somewhat related to number two, where we know we're missing loss that's not picked up as a stand replacement disturbance in the UMD data. Um, once we're able to detect those disturbances using higher resolution satellite imagery, we then need to figure out how to assign carbon loss values to those disturbances, like fire and selective logging and partial thinnings in managed forests. Next, we have a lot of work to do on the carbon removal side or the plus side of red plus uh, to understand the rate at which forests sequester carbon, both across space and through time. And I think that's going to be possible as we improve our biomass mapping capabilities. That's the topic of another breakout session that Laura, Laura Duncanson, I think, is chairing. But better understanding the spatial dis distribution of biomass over a landscape should help with space for time type analyses that can help constrain these relationships that exist between stand age and biomass. And we also need research that can help link information on harvested wood products with information on what the impacts of those harvest activities are on what we're observing in the forest itself. And finally, we have a lot of reconciliations to figure out, both in comparing the IPCC gain loss approach to the stock difference approaches that many countries use for reporting and that are also starting to emerge from the remote sensing community as far as mapping biomass change directly is concerned. And there's also this somewhat separate research community focused on understanding terrestrial ecosystem dynamics based on top-down atmospheric measurements from satellite missions like OCO2 and 3, 
And it's probably time for what has been a relatively fragmented research community on this topic to come together so that we can help, help start triangulating a bit and better understanding what is and what is not being captured by these various observation methods, which should help to better quantify and hopefully reduce uncertainties at various spatial scales. And with that, I'm gonna leave it all to you guys to figure out and, and finalize a list of research priorities. I hope this gets you started and I'm happy to join any follow-up conversations that emerge from this workshop. And I wish you a very good and productive discussion. Thanks. Hello, I will tell briefly about forest area estimation and uh, forest variable estimation uh, as an input for forest carbon modeling. This slide shows the main steps for forest uh, carbon and carbon flux estimation. On the left hand side we have the reference data that are needed always if we want to uh, estimate the uncertainty of the all the variables in the in the chain. Reference data should be collected uh, using a probability sampling that is uh, random sampling and of course the measurement should be done carefully. For the forest area we can also use a sample from very high resolution data and interpret the plots on the very high resolution data visually. But for the structural variables, we need to have actual ground measurements. And further on, we can, uh, using modeling, we can transform these forest variable estimates to free biomass. And uh, when we add the weather data, we can estimate also the carbon fluxes. At every step, we have the model error. And uh, as it comes to the reference data, we have also the sampling error and the measurement error. The sampling error can be quite large, depends on the sample size, of course. This slide shows the data sources of the chain. At the bottom, we have the field data uh, that provide vari many variable values and uh, can be very accurate, but we cannot uh, get the maps and the data collection can be very expensive as well. At the top, we have uh, the wall-to-wall -wall mapping from satellite data. And if we only use satellite data, we can get the maps, but we don't know the accuracy at all. And in the middle, we have this uh, sample from very high res resolution imagery that can be used uh, very effectively for land cover variable estimation. When we combine all these data sources, we can get maps with known and harmonized accuracy and for many variables. This is an example from our framework program 7 Project North State, where we took a sample of 40 very high resolution images shown as dots on the left hand side from our area of interest. Within each very high re resolution image, we interpreted uh, 64 plots of 60 by 60 meter and the land cover class proportions within each plot. These images and uh, interpretation results were used to estimate the forest area from the very high resolution data. And this is shown on the table on the right hand side, the second column uh, from the right, 70.7% estimate of the forest area and the 95% confidence intervals from about 62 to about 80%, so relatively broad confidence intervals with this uh, 40 sample size of, of very high resolution images. The forest area estimate uh, from the Suomi NPP satellite data that was used in this project was 71.9%, uh, so very close to the average from the very high resolution sample. And the reference data for the Suomi NPP 
Mir's image estimation was completely different from the very high resolution sample. It was another reference data. This is an example from another project uh, that is still ongoing, Forest Flux, and a biomass estimate from Sentinel-2 images, image in Finland, a 40 by, uh, 4 by 4 kilometer, and the image on the left-hand side, in a color infrared color coding. Same satellite, same pixel size, 10 meter, and an estimate of forest growing stock volume over a large area. We have Finland on the left hand side and part of Western Russia um, east of that. This is from an ESA project, Assess Carbon, that was recently completed. Some examples about combination of Sentinel-2 data and airborne laser scanner data. This is an estimate of the growing stock volume using Sentinel-2 data only. It's not so bad an estimate, but we start getting underestimation after uh, about 200 cubic meters per hectare, and uh, we have actually an overestimate at lower level. So the, our model is averaging the estimation. So the reference data is on the horizontal axis, and then the ver vertical axis is our estimate. When we combine airborne laser scanner data, we can increase the accuracy and reliability of the estimation. However, airborne laser scanner data are quite um, luxury in many locations in the globe. We don't have it simply. The main information gaps in satellite image-based forest estimation may be in the availability of reference data, reference data in general and reference data for the estimation of the change uh, accuracy reliability in particular. This is really a big unresolved issue. Also radar data use is still at a much more experimental level, I think, than the use of optical data. Our forestry thematic exploitation platform may not resolve these reference data availability issues, but it can be a tool to improve forest variable estimation, in particular when you register on it and uh, input your own applications on, on the platform. So please welcome, register and start using forestry tip. Thank you. Good morning. In this work, I'm going to present how repeated high-resolution health observations can be integrated with process-based models to provide estimates of carbon fluxes on large areas. Process-based models are mathematical representation of ecological processes and allows quantifying phenomena such as greenhouse gas exchanges and forest growth. Forest structural variables such as tree diameter, tree eye, and basal area are used to initialize forest models and the reliability of model predictions largely depends on the accuracy of those initial variables. Nowadays, a huge amount of data of different sources is becoming available. For large-scale forest simulation, repeated measurements of satellite data at high resolution can be used to estimate the state of the forests. Data simulation is the science that allows to combine model predictions with data from multiple sources. Furthermore, by means of data simulation, it is possible to continuously integrate new information in the system every time they become available. Our objective was to develop a framework for assimilating repeated health observation at high resolution and model simulation for carbon flux estimations. In this study, we considered three tiles of 100 by 100 kilometers across Finland. For those tiles, two sets of Sentinel-2 data from 2016 and 2019 were acquired and processed. The data at a resolution of 10 by 10 meters. In addition, field measurements were collected uh, for the same years. 
from the satellite data, it was possible to estimate uh, the initial state of the forest that then was used in the forest process-based models. In this work, we used uh, the process-based model PREBAS that simulates the growth and the carbon balance of the forest. PREBAS uses uh, weather input and site-specific inputs um, to predict the carbon balance of and water balance of the forest. In addition, it simulates the growth of the forest, forest and simulates how the uh, forest variable dynamically change over time. Bayesian method was used for data simulation. Uh, the Bayesian method uh, has the advantage of taking into account of the uncertainty in the data and the model because it's based on probability theory. The model was initialized with observation-based estimates for 2016. Then a Monte Carlo simulation was used to take into account of for the initial state uncertainty. The model then was run and the output for 2019 was combined with the new um, satellite data for 2019. The results of the data simulation then was used to calculate the, uh, the carbon fluxes and forest growth uh, by means of PREBAS model. All data simulation calculation were performed on a pixel basis. In this grid plot, the columns represent different forest structural variables, while the row are the results from two different pixels. The Sentinel-2 based estimates for 2016 were used to initialize the model and are represented by the blue distribution in the plot. Then the model was run until 2019 and we got new uh, estimates for 2019 that are represented by the green um, distributions. At the same time, we got new satellite-based estimate for 2019 that are represented by the yellow distributions, while the data simulation was the combination of these two distributions and is represented by the red distribution in the plots. In some cases, the model and the Sentinel-2-based estimates for 2019 were consistent, but in other cases, the data simulation results was the compromise between the two distributions. In all the cases, the data simulations allowed to reduce the uncertainty in the, in the estimates. The results of data simulations were used to uh, map the state of the forest and the carbon fluxes at 10 by 10 meter resolution. Those results would be the starting point for future data simulations. The data simulation framework we developed is a useful tool for monitoring carbon fluxes and forest growth at different scales. Data simulation is also really useful to evaluate models and data. In fact, it allows to identify if a data acquisition is biased or if there is a systematic bias in the data. It also allows to identify problems in the structure of forest models. The use of field measurements is always desirable for new data acquisitions because it allows to better quantify uncertainties. Data simulation has also the great advantage of reducing uncertainties in model estimates. Data simulation is a really powerful tool and its use can be extended to any kind of model and any kind of data. This last aspect is particularly relevant since different types of forest data are continuously collected. Another interesting aspect is the need to integrate in the framework routines that allow to identify disturbances over large areas. The data simulation framework has been developed and evaluated for boreal forests, but can be applied to any kind of environments, and it would be particularly interesting to implement the framework for tropical forests. However, to extend the applicability of the framework to new environments, it is important to have data to test and develop the forest models. Hello everyone, I am Lobati Masolele from Wageningen University. And today I will be presenting to you my PhD research topic on the use of spatial and temporal deep learning method for driving land use following deforestation.
Through this presentation, I take you through my first PhD case studies and the case study for Ethiopia and its challenges. This work anchors on Paris Agreement, which emphasizes the importance of land use sector for mitigating climate change. The goal of this research is to develop good practice methodologies for monitoring approaches that assist countries with limited resources and data in implementing improved monitoring in the land use sector. In our first PhD case study, we use start to imagine to classify land use following deforestation in the pantropics. And the data set used was a dense time series of Lancet data from 2000 to 2005. And the method which we used was a spatial temporal and spatial temporal deep learning method to predict land use following deforestation. And uh, this method can be easily implemented in SEPA, which is a FAO platform. Uh, with our model, you can be able to predict land use uh, throughout the panthropoxy using Hansen forest loss as a, a mask. This is an example of the distribution of reference data used in our study, showing different land use following deforestation in the panthropics. Here is a comparison of uh, different spatial, temporal, and spatial temporal models in predicting land use following deforestation. And we have continental models, but also pantropical models. So as you can see, uh, mostly uh, in both of these uh, uh, results, uh, like for the first result, the first figure you have in Asia, you have Latin America, the second figure, Africa and in pantropics. Uh, most difference can be seen in the pantropics where you can see vividly that uh, the spatial temporal models, uh, they were uh, having high score in terms of predicting land uses compared to the model which use only spatial temporal information. But also this is that can be seen in the continental models. But uh, surprisingly, of course, we saw that uh, the spatial model performed much better even competitively compared to the temporal uh, models uh, showing that uh, spatial uh, information has more importance uh, in the pantropoxy if you want to detect the land use following the deforestation uh, compared to the temporal models. Also, uh, we visually compared uh, between the dominant follow-up land use for each sample location for prediction uh, versus the reference uh, follow-up land use uh, using uh, the continental models. Uh, here we represent uh, a dominant uh, land use of uh, uh, each sample location and uh, we have these bubbles where uh, for each bubble, you have uh, first uh, half of the bubble representing the reference and the second representing uh, the prediction uh, for each uh, land use. And uh, this class colors represent uh, the land use following deforestation. And when you have a bubble which has only one color, it means the reference and the, the predicted land use is the same. And when you have two colors within a bubble, it means uh, the reference and the predicted land use are, are different. And as you can see, most we have uh, most bubbles have one color, which means uh, we have a good prediction. But you can also see there are some areas where you have different colors, and uh, especially, for example, in Latin America, along the arc of uh, deforestation along the Amazon, you have a very good uh, prediction. But most of the uh, misclassification can be seen at the southern part uh, of uh, Latin America, where mostly the confusion between pasta and uh, large-scale cropland and uh, this might be related to the fact that over time uh, they extensively manage large-scale cropland uh, they tend to be uh, overused and uh, during one or two rotation cycles uh, thus they tend to exhibit a similar texture and a special arrangement compared to the newly established pasture uh, or large-scale cropland in the arc of uh, deforestation within the Amazon. So from this study, we've learned that uh, the spatial temporal models are best suited for land use classification uh, in, the in the pantropical regions. But also local tuning is important, especially like you can have seen that the continental models, uh, they have achieved higher accuracy. Uh, compared to pantropical or global models. And also last week, uh, we saw that the CN 2D CNN, which is a spatial model performed uh, uh, better than the 
LSTM, which is a temporal model, this suggests that there is a very higher intra-region homogeneity in terms of spatial pattern colorizing land use than in terms of temporal pattern. In the next step, we intend to develop a model for a country scale, uh, which is uh, Ethiopia. Uh, using the high layer resolution imagery, the uh, planet imagery, which has been released recently. And uh, the scale of analysis uh, is in, in SEPA, which is a free uh, platform provided by FAO. And the output expected from our, uh, this, our next research will be the method for assessing land use, uh, specifically for Ethiopia, uh, implemented in SEPA, and also the research output on forest and the land use change for Ethiopia. So a few challenges we have encountered when working with uh, uh, Ethiopia, uh, we found that uh, the data set uh, trained on global or continental scale may not be suitable for another data set or at a country scale. Uh, also, we found that uh, the deforestation drivers, number of classes found in one country or at a global scale may not uh, well represent be present in another country. So you might have to decrease or uh, add in other classes which were not there. But also there is a limited availability of a different data set on deforestation drivers uh, uh, in Ethiopia, both spatially and temporally. And lastly, limited availability of computational resources. So we are using the uh, uh, SEPA, which has uh, mostly the CPUs, the instances, and it doesn't have GPU, which is mostly used uh, for fast computation, especially for deep learning models. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Diviana Sayes. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the GLAD lab at the University of Maryland, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about our recent uh, paper published in Science Advances that focuses on the expansion of human impact on natural land across South America since 1985. And really briefly, we focus on South America because it is the continent that likely has experienced the most change out of any other continent as related to the expansion of agricultural commodities over natural land. Um, most notably, soybean production, for example, has gone from um, a quarter of it being produced in South America to over half over this 34 year period. And South America is also a leading exporter of other major agricultural commodities. And at the same time, it is, of course, also home to really critically important natural ecosystems such as the Amazon, the Cejado, uh, the Chiquitania forest, and the Chaco. So to go over the method methodology really briefly, uh, this is the general methodology employed across uh, most of our land use and land cover change monitoring projects at the GLAD lab. We are very methodical about this and we really um, preach this idea that we have this two-step methodology. We do a map and then we use the map to stratify and then do a sampling assessment, not just for accuracy assessment of the map, but more importantly for area estimation of areas of um, land cover and land cover change. And so this basic idea was implemented across South America. We created uh, a series of different maps and we aggregated them together. And the resulting map stratifies the continent in terms of uh, la natural land cover classes and uh, stable natural land cover classes moving beyond just tree cover and into just general natural land, as well as uh, some salient land use classes such as cropland and cropland expansion, plantations, tree regrowth, and really noticeably this class that we call other land use, which is the leftover class once we aggregate all the layers together, which is a really good proxy for the pasture land use. And this map is used as a stratifier from which then we can do a, a stratified random sample of a thousand sample pixels and this is what we use to do our area estimate. Each uh, sample pixel is interpreted using all available Landsat imagery as well as the time series of spectral indices and uh, high resolution Google Earth imagery wherever it's available. The labeling of the pixels followed a hierarchical legend of land cover and land use classes, which you can see here. And most importantly, we distinguish between classes that we call measurable human impact classes, which range from uh, land use all the way to degradation, from the natural land cover classes, 
and we say measurable from the perspective of the 30 meter Landsat pixel. And the results show the degree to which humans have appropriated natural land across the South American continent. We see a 60% increase in uh, human impact across the continent since 1985. This translates to over 21 soccer fields per minute over the past 34 years of impact on natural land by humans. So it's a really dramatic transformation of the continent over the course of a single generation. The single most significant land change dynamic was the loss of natural tree cover. We see a 16% decrease over this 34-year uh, time period. Uh, pasture land use increased by 23%. We see a 2.6 increase in cropland area and a quadrupling of tree plantations. So we can have these trends disaggregated by theme and by region. We can also see uh, results in terms of from two dynamics. We see that the most prevalent land cover transition is the conversion of natural tree cover in 1985 to pasture in 2018, once again, proving the pasture is the leading driver of deforestation across South America. We also see significant conversion of pasture cropland. And we also found, interestingly, uh, a lot of land that falls under a category that we call transitional land. It's land that it's in a state of arrested development um, be in the conversion between a natural land cover towards a land use or um, being restored from a land use to a land cover. Um, and there is there were about 55 million hectares of transitional land by 2018 across the continent which represents an area about the size of Spain um, that represents significant loss in ecosystem services with no attendant uh, economic benefits. So it's a class that should be of particular concern to policymakers. In terms of remaining challenges, we need to move towards operational monitoring of relevant themes at the global scale. And this means moving beyond just maps uh, and, and focusing on um, sampling for area estimation as is recommended by uh, IPCC guidelines. Um, since we this results in area estimates with known uncertainties, um, and it's really important that our policy recommendations and emission estimates are derived not from pixel counting from a map, but from area estimates, which have reduced bias and have um, known uncertainties, as was done in this study. In terms of Themes of interest, agricultural commodities are going to be hugely important. Um, that's something we see in this paper where we looked at cropland and plantations and pasture, but we can move beyond those things and look into themes such as intensification, crop type, different types of plantations, etc. Um, we also need to consider from two dynamics um, because this is what determines the drivers of land use change, which is really important and if we have hopes of reducing uh, deforestation rates and land natural vegetation conversion and uh, beyond that looking at um, also focusing on non-binary change so trying to um, get better estimates for degradation which is still something that we are not doing great at. Um, part of the reason for that is that we don't know what we cannot see and this goes into you know moving towards the technical challenges moving forward you know we have to be um, honest about the limitations of the signal from the satellite and not overstate our capabilities. Um, we need to be aware of what we can reliably see and be aware that for some of the themes we're going to have to go in the field, um, things like degradation or crop type are much, we cannot see that from the satellite perspective. And so field work is going to be necessary and the uh, probability sampling is going to be important in this regard. And further, just uh, it is important to keep in mind that we have problems with the historical record for Landsat because capabilities have changed in the in the satellites. Um, we cannot easily extrapolate and go backwards in time. And so moving forward, we have to make sure that there is consistency in future missions in terms of um, the bands and the resolution so that we can have a consistent record, uh, historical record of land cover and land use change. Um, to measure change from. That's all. Thank you.